Thank you for that gracious introduction. I'm all mic'd up tonight. I hope both microphones are working now. <laughs> okay. So I got all kinds of wires coming off me here. It's uh, actually my first time flying into Sacramento. And it's a pretty campus. I got to see it for the first time today. So hopefully I'll be able to walk around a little more tomorrow. In a memorable, memorable passage from the 1994 book, Pale Blue Dot, the late astronomer Carl Sagan reflects on an image of Earth taken by the Voyager 1 NASA spacecraft uh, from 4 billion miles away. You can see it as that very tiny speck of light there, and uh, caught in that ray of light, which is actually due to internal reflection in the optics of the camera from the bright sunlight. The sun is just off the uh, camera field of view. In that book, Carl Sagan uh, writes, because of the reflection of sunlight, the Earth seems to be sitting in a beam of light, as if there were some special significance to this small world. But it's just an accident of geometry and optics. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. This guy sounds like a barrel of laughs. <laughs> Cocktail parties, right? The fashionable idea that we are insignificant in the cosmic scheme is known as the Copernican Principle, named after the astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, who died in 1543. According to the popular story, Copernicus demoted us by showing that ours was a sun-centered universe with Earth both rotating on its axis and revolving around the sun like the other planets. He dislodged us from our central place and therefore demoted us. Scientists since Copernicus have only reinforced this initial dethroning. Let me just give you a couple of very succinct definitions of the Copernican Principle. The first we might call the Classical Copernican Principle, or CCP. It says there's nothing special about the time, place, or status of Earth in the cosmos. There's also a version uh, that I sometimes like to call the metaphysically bloated Copernican Principle, which is a metaphysical extrapolation from this, which says we're not here for a purpose, and the cosmos isn't arranged with us in mind. Our astronomical location is as insignificant as our metaphysical status. In other words, since we're not centrally located, therefore our location in time and place and our metaphysical status are insignificant. That's the take home message of the Copernican principle. Open virtually any introductory astronomy textbook and you will read some version of this story. It has a single decisive problem. It's false. Historians of science have protested this description of the development of science for decades. But so far, their protests have not trickled down to the masses or to the textbook writers. The real story is more subtle. The pre-Copernican cosmology envisioned by Aristotle, Ptolemy, and other ancients was a set of nested concentric spheres that encircled our Earth. The center of the universe was considered no place of honor, any more than we think of the center of Earth as being somehow exalted. And the Earth was certainly not thought to be sitting at the center of heaven. Quite the opposite, it was seen as the corruptible base and heavy portion of the cosmos. Things were thought to fall to Earth because of their heaviness. The Earth in pre-Copernican cosmology was the bottom of the universe rather than its center. When Christian theology was added to the mix in the Middle Ages, the bottom of the universe became, quite literally, hell. Dante's divine comedy immortalized this vision, taking the reader from the Earth's surface through the nine circles of hell, which mirror the nine celestial spheres above. For Dante, there was indeed a throne at the center of the cosmos, Satan's throne. Far from demoting the status of the Earth, Copernicus and other astronomers of the period saw the new scheme as exalting it. They thought that Earth's new position removed it from its place of dishonor. Still, logically, one cannot determine our metaphysical status from our location alone. Geocentrism does not imply anthropocentrism, either historically or logically. The official story gives the false impression that Copernicus started a trend, so that removing the Earth from the center of the universe led finally, logically and inevitably, to the scientific establishment 
of our insignificance. Is the earth really an insignificant speck in an impersonal universe? Do we exist for no purpose? Or is the truth otherwise? To begin to answer these questions, we need to consider whether there is anything special about the earth and the life on it. Fast forward to the early part of the 20th century. Shaped by their belief that there is nothing special about Earth and its inhabitants, many scientists argued that whatever has happened here must have happened elsewhere, countless times. Such were the views of Percival Lowell, who imagined a civilization on Mars, while other scientists speculated about life on other planets and moons in the solar system. Images of the dry, cratered terrain of Mars and the hell-like surface of Venus returned by space probe dash these hopes. Today we know that Earth, Earth is the only planet with intelligent life in the solar system and probably the only inhabited planet in the solar system. How similar to Earth does a planet have to be for it to be habitable? Well, astrobiology is the area of science that seeks to answer questions like this one. What sorts of conditions do you need to have life uh, on some other planet in the universe beyond the Earth. Most discussions of this sort begin in the field of astrobiology by trying to come up with a universal definition of life. Problem is, there is no such single universal definition of life. You ask any three astrobiologists for a definition of life and you get three different answers. Luckily, we can actually make progress on this question, uh, not by defining life, but coming up with just a few basic necessary requirements for life. Not, not a sufficient list, but uh, some very important requirements such that if you don't satisfy one or more of these, then you're not going to have life. So I'm going to give you a couple of important necessary requirements. One of them, the first one, most importantly, all known life and any conceivable life based on chemistry must be based on a molecule complex enough to encode the information needed to build an organism. And secondly, life chemistry requires a medium within which the basic information molecule can react efficiently with many other kinds of molecules. So these are rather uncontroversial, very basic needs of life. Uh, there are two uh, types of uh, elements or molecules that satisfy these conditions for Earth life and arguably for any conceivable uh, life based on the periodic table that we know of in our universe. The first requirement is met by carbon. Carbon is the best element for building large information-rich molecules such as DNA and proteins because they can form very long chains and metastable bonds with several other elements. No other element can match carbon in these respects. The second requirement is met by liquid water. Liquid water is by far the best choice as a universal liquid medium for the chemical reactions of life. It's uh, called the universal solvent for good reason has a number of unique or nearly unique properties, such as the hydrophobic effect, which is very important for the folding of proteins into their three-dimensional bioactive shapes. In fact, I recommend a book uh, written by Michael Denton called Nature's Destiny that gets into these topics if you happen to like chemistry. And there's a, a classic text on this called uh, uh, The Fitness of the Environment for Life by Lawrence Henderson, a Harvard chemist from the early part of the 20th century, which is a uh, very enjoyable read also. But of course you need more than carbon and liquid water for life. Uh, this is what I might call the periodic table of life. You have periodic tables here up on the wall, uh, but uh, here I've identified those elements that are essential for life. Uh, in the uh, dark or gray color uh, are the elements necessary for uh, a bacterium, for, for example. There are 17 of them. And uh, you need another, another 10 essential elements uh, for human beings and other uh, complex mammals. Now, for a planet to have life, then, it needs to have carbon chemistry occurring in a liquid water medium and many other uh, elements that are needed in the uh, biochemical reactions. And these have to be supplied in the right chemical forms and the right amounts, and they have to be cycled in that environment. So these already, uh, starting with the basic chemistry, we have already constrained in a big way the kind of environment uh, that you need for life. For a variety of reasons, 
the best sort of environment is the surface of a terrestrial planet. I can only get into a few of those details tonight. Uh, but when I discuss a habitable planet from now on, what I mean is a terrestrial planet that can support complex carbon-based uh, life in a liquid water medium. Now, there are restricted regions in the universe where you can have such a planet. Uh, 